to Creative Vitality Jam Sessions. Here we have intimate conversations with extraordinary dance and theater artists about reimagining creativity and supporting and building community. Creative Vitality Jam Sessions and I walk in solidarity as allies for respect, justice, and equality. Black Lives Matter, and we must keep walking the walk in order for change to come. I'm Helen Pickett, and today's guest is Kathleen Breen Combs. She is the Executive Director of Festival Ballet Providence. Kathleen and I have known each other since 2005. Hey, Kathleen. Hello. Hi. I'm so Hi. happy to see you here. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, I just have to say one more thing about you because it was in my intro. <laughs> I, have to, I was so impressed with this quote. The New York Times said about Kathleen's dancing, she's a ballerina of colossal scale and boldness. <laughs> I mean, come <laughs> on. And I can actually support that comment because I got to work with Kathleen many times while she was a principal dancer. Actually, from the time she was a very young dancer, you know, getting, you know, going on her way from 2005, she was in many of the new creations I did for Boston. So I just, I had to say that, Kathleen, because uh, <laughs> thank you. And, I need to, first of all, ask you where you are in the world. I am in Providence, Rhode Island, our new home. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> um, so I'm really happy to have you here. And before we get to the heart of the interview, um, I know that you earned a Bachelor of Science and then went on to get a graduate certificate while dancing full time. At that point, you also had a daughter, and um, you've recently also given birth to your second child, a little boy, and I want you to elaborate on the, you know, I women can do anything, so I'm just going to put that out there. So I, I just accept that. <laughs> right. But I do want to know where your your drive came from and how you did actually um, not just manage this, but manage a principal career, working with new, you know, choreographers, studying for two degrees, being a mother. I just, I would like you to elaborate on that because I find that truly inspiring. Thank you. I, I was never one of those dancers who thought my career was going to go on forever. Like, I always knew that there was an end to my onstage life. And I was very aware of that at a, probably an earlier time than most other dancers that I, you know, speak with. And my parents always said, you know, the career's short. Just, you know, chip away at your degree. Keep going. Just even if you're taking one class at a time, continue on. So that's what I did. And even when I started, I started taking a few classes at the University of Massachusetts, you know, early on in my career. And then incredibly, two donors at Boston Ballet set up this program through Northeastern University. And it allowed the um, university to give the dancers an 80% scholarship. Wow. So I was kind of like, you have, I have to do this, you know, so there was no excuse anymore. It wasn't money. It wasn't, you know, it was just really like there was this opportunity, take it. So I just, you know, no pressure on myself, decided to chip away at my career. My undergrad took about six years and I was in my senior year um, when I got pregnant with my first child and I had three classes left and I decided um, that you, Northeastern University has this really cool program. It's a co-op program where you can uh, create your own classes. So I spoke with the director at Boston Ballet, Nico Niesenen, his uh, assistant, Liz Olds, and I said, you know, can I work in the organization while I'm on maternity leave? And I can get, you know, a view of the other side of the organization mm -hmm. while I'm not on stage. So that was really my first opportunity to step away from being the product on stage and figuring out how that product gets on stage. And it was really um, 
a really interesting year for me, just perspective wise, because it was so much always about myself and my art, and all of a sudden it became about the, the art as a whole. Um, so that was eye opening. And so I came back, and there was about a year and a half gap where, you know, I was totally focused on getting back my, you know, onto stage, my career. I just had a baby, but I had graduated. And I decided, you know what, I really enjoyed that aspect of what I was doing. I think that's something that I want to do post stage. You know, I really want to focus on the admin. I feel it's really important for artists who know the business side to continue um, working in, you know, the arts and not just leaving it or just saying, you know, I'll do something just creative that we also have the capability to do something administratively. So I, you know, told my husband and bless him, he did not bat an eyelash when I said, hey, I'm going to go for my graduate degree. <laughs> and, um, and I made it work. You know, there's so much time in the theater where, you know, they're doing lighting or, you know, you're not in a certain piece. And I would just use that time. And in between rehearsal and a performance, I'd go have my dinner, I'd come back and I'd write a paper yeah. or I'd, do my ballet and I'd have to wait until the end for bows or something and I'd be the one in the corner under like a dark stage light you know finishing accounting work <laughs> so you know it's just I became really efficient and you know like you said we can do anything and um, it was something that was important to me and I just figured I'd you know no stress and just keep plugging on to get it done yeah what what comes out was the actual one line summation you said was it was important to you and mm -hmm. i say this also when i'm in the studio um or if i'm if i'm teaching right i say if you need to dance so let's try and let's translate need to important you will find a way mm -hmm. and that that's the point you have the energy you need and it's amazing how when we are focused on something we really love and want all this energy we're filled with energy even when tired you know it's just it's Absolutely. just it's a great thing to remember that even those times when this like now when things are so so you know turbulent and 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 just really poignantly full of fear and everything else it, it that drive i think that need is the thing that will sustain. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, you, you see all the art coming out of it, you know? That's right. That's Which right. is wonderful to witness and yeah. access to it, you know, and the different platforms it's being put on. That's true. And I believe it will have staying power. I think this will be become part of our performative life, you know? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it stays. Yeah. So, um, I would, the next question, um, if you can, you know, expand more on it, but uh, we could go to the next one. So I was going to ask you to tell us more about yourself. Um, and then part of that question was also, and perhaps this is where we go, um, maybe tell us about how it is to, in your new executive position. Um, I find that another total reimagining, which you spoke of briefly now. Um, yeah, what what is what is that like to be in this role to govern a company basically, and and you know maybe that's also what you're currently working on. I, I can only imagine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I pitch a really great year to go into arts management. <laughs> like talk you're going to learn a lot, right? Exactly. Like talk yeah. about being thrown into the fire, and I yeah. really feel like if I can survive this, you know, I'll pretty much be good to go. We'll survive. But, yeah, it's it's been about survival and I you know what's happened to our industry is like heartbreaking on so many levels. You know, daily I you know, I go back and forth and there's days where I'm really optimistic and then days where I'm just really like the weight of it is just too much to even bear. Um and even, you know, going forward in this year just thinking about all of, you know, the variables and all the people that it's affecting. So it's, it's difficult, you know, and, and all of that weighs on you as you're making decisions just to even keep your organization open. And, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, I feel like I should have a PhD in scenario planning at this point, because daily, like my, my, 
plans for next season change. And that's the hardest thing right now. It's, you know, we don't even know what's going to happen. So I feel like I have all this time. I feel like I should be doing so much right now. And I can't even plan for the next show. You know, I feel like I should have, you know, who has three months to plan things, you know? And I feel like I should have 10 years planned out and I don't even know what our current season is going to look like. And I, you know, I, I'm so tired of, you know, going into an organizational meeting or a company meeting and being like, I wish I had more to tell you because, you know, and, and that's the hardest thing right now is just all the unknowns and dealing with that. And having said that, it's also been like a really nice time for reflection as well and to, to step back and say, okay, how can we come out of this different? You know, how can, how can we, you know, what was what we were doing working? You yeah. know, do we need to reformat some things? Um, how can we streamline some things? And, you know, I think the biggest mistake for any company would come out of this and just continue to do the same thing. Yeah, I, I don't think it's possible. I think you're right. Or, and I think maybe there will be people that try to almost force that square peg into the round hole, but yeah. I don't even see how that's possible at this point. Yeah. No. And I also, I mean, I think I'm lucky in the terms of being a smaller organization that I think we've been able to pivot a little bit quicker. You know, in two weeks, we had an online quarter four. We've pivoted completely to create like a hybrid online, in-person, socially distanced summer program. Um, you know, so our staff is smaller. And I think because of that, we've been able to react a little quicker. You know, we were able to hold a virtual gala, which was much more successful than I had anticipated it to be, Great. thankfully. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's been interesting too, to see kind of, you know, a lot, you know, what I was worried at first that, oh my gosh, you know, we're a smaller company, we're never going to survive this. And in turn, that's kind of shifted to be like, hey, you know, we're, we're the little boat, the Spanish Armada, you know, running around being able to, to figure things out. So that's yeah, been more, more plastic, right? More fluid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're, of course, in your principal career, you reimagined yourself many times as a dancer in many different roles, both, um, and I, and I want to speak to this a bit, both in the contemporary, perhaps, let's say, non-traditional narrative and narrative. Um, can you share an example or examples of how those processes contributed to how you think about art? Um, those shifts that happened as you layered these roles, you know, through your years and how things might have how that shifted how you all, your perspective within yourself and perhaps, as you said, perhaps as an art, you know, on a whole. Yeah, I was, I was really lucky to get to do kind of like everything. You know, I, I got to do the classical roles, both the really cute girl roles, and then I always got like the main characters as well. So I had this, you know, like, I was able, yeah, I was able to do like the Lila Curry and the Carabas and, you know, the Giselle and the Myrta, nice. um, you know, and... I always, as much as the cute characters, and they were oftentimes the better roles, were fulfilling, you know, I learned early on, like, I liked that, um, the sense of power and, um, you know, embodiment that I could get in these, these other roles. And, you know, I hate that they were always the negative role, you know, or the mean role, that the powerful woman was always, you know, the bad character. <laughs> But I think that's why later on in my career, I really, you know, I much preferred doing the more contemporary work because I felt like I could still have that embodiment. I felt that I could have that agency and authority and, and not be evil <laughs> and be myself. And, and that's where that shifted, um, having, you know, to go through that process. So I enjoyed those roles further on. And I think that helped me um, moving forward into my next career too, to understand, to, you know, step away and, you know, how can you portray yourself, you know, authoritatively without um, that negative aspect? 
Exactly. Beautifully said. Yeah. And also, I think what I heard you also say is things aren't always as they seem. The perceived better role <laughs> might not hold the power. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and um, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, did, um, so kind of around the same question, but um, was there a point, for example, a point, did an injury actually teach you about, teach you further? Did you have an injury? You weren't really injured, as I remember, right? Not so I had a few. I never had any, like, major, you know, injuries, but I had a few, like, ankle injuries, you know, sprains that, you know, torn ligaments that took me out for a few months. And, oh. you know. And how did that shift your perspective as a dancer? Anytime you're injured and anytime you step away from your art, it teaches you something, right? So, um, you know, being injured is always like this negative thing. So there, you know, mentally you have to work up towards, you know, what can I learn from this? What can I move forward? And even being pregnant, it was the first time I had to step away from my art without it being a negative thing. Right. And so that was really interesting because I was happy but I wasn't dancing and how could I, you know, move forward in that too. And, you know, that was actually the first time that I was able to sit in the audience and, and enjoy it without being like the critical dancer. And, and that's something that I carried forward, you know, like how can you just start at a level of appreciation instead of critique and move forward. And I really, you know, that's my, biggest thing with every anytime I watch an artist or a choreographer you know like to start at that level of what they're offering you and then form a critical opinion you know and look at that but you know that was the first time I was able to really step away and do that and I was like oh I think I'm maturing <laughs> you know yeah, it, was, it wasn't just about my art <laughs> right and you're stepping away from judgment exactly and look yeah beautiful beautiful yeah. um so do you have an insight or a daily inspiration um, besides your two gorgeous babies and your <laughs> wonderful husband, who I also know quite well, Yuri, do you have any daily inspiration or insight that you, that perhaps helps you get through these times or in general? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm very optimistic like as a person, you know, I've, I've learned, you know, sometimes maybe overly, you know, and I, I try to see the best in a situation. I try to see the opportunity and that has been something really big. And in this new position, you know, I'm not in the studio as much. And sometimes I feel a little bit separated from the art. So every once in a while, I'm just like, I need to just go sit in the studio and be surrounded by it and remember what I'm doing this for. And, you know, there's been moments this year where I'm sitting in the audience and it just kind of like comes through me like, this is why I'm doing this. You know, like this moment right here is why I'm doing this. So, you know, it's just kind of remembering what we are doing and always going back to the art. That's the biggest thing, you know, and like I was saying before, these smaller companies, um, it's not, you know, I feel like some of these larger companies have become almost corporate in ways of which they're run. And, you know, like I, I purposely, I'm always like, just go back to the art, go back to the art. Don't let, you know, the, your decisions be run by this corporate mindset. Like, yes, we have to be business minded. Yes, we have to be, you know, fiscally savvy and know how that everything's going to work, but start with the art. Beautiful. Um, you were a guest, well, you've been a guest speaker in many places and you also created a TED talk. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, early on in my career in Boston, I was asked to just start speaking at different events. And I felt like every time they asked me, I was like, this is a great opportunity just to, you know, do something outside of my comfort zone. Because as a dancer, you're silent on stage, you're muted. And as a female dancer, um, especially from a young age, you're just expected to nod your head and do whatever you're told. 
And so this was the first time I felt like I had some agency and I could speak about my art and also to not just do what people said, but to step back and critically think about how I approached a role, you know, and how I could speak about what I had gone through. And that's really important because a lot of times that doesn't happen in ballet training. I think we're getting better at that. I want to get even more <laughs> um, into that with, you know, my dancers and to really speak about what we're doing and why we're doing it and the choices you make. And it's okay to have different choices. And when you're in a rehearsal with somebody to discuss those choices and not just, you know, nod your head, even though you don't agree with it. So these speaking opportunities were a way for me to kind of vocalize some of those ideas. And I think that that was my first um, opportunity to really, uh, think about my future and say, hey, you know, I think that this is something that I would like to continue to do. So having each of them every time I did something else, you know, as terrifying as they were initially, and um, they really taught me something and taught me that, you know, I had more to say. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question, actually, it's a little off script. Um, and then I have the final question from here. <laughs> when we worked together, in the studio. Um, I feel like what you're talking about is something I've worked for my entire um, career as a choreographer. Also, you know, growing up in the company I grew up in, I was handed that as well. And you also worked with Bill quite a bit yeah. toward um, the latter part of your career. Do you feel like there were any seeds planted from, especially like Sukio, when we were in that room as six people making that together? And even in Atesian, when you would actually, for the first time, start, do an improv on stage. And I remember early on you talking about that, that this kind of, this taste, I know that that, that gave you something because we spoke about it before. There was this taste already of like, wait a minute, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually in charge of this career that I'm creating. Did, yes. Any comments about that? Yeah. And I mean, you know, you gave me the opportunity to improv on stage in silence for the first time in my career. And that was something, yeah. And that was something I had never done. And, you know, I was so used to being told exactly what to do. And in, you know, which is lovely and it's a part of the art and, you know, not that we should hide behind the art and say everything's fine, but, you know, that was kind of the way it was. And this was the first time, you know, and kind of going back that shift into my love of contemporary work, you know, where I all of a sudden felt empowered and I all of a sudden felt like, hey, I have something to say as an artist and, as much as it's, you know, your work or the choreographer's work that you're working to, you know, even with Bill, he'd just, you know, do whatever you want, go for it. You know, I'll tell you if it's, you know, too much or wrong. Mm -hmm. But the fact that like the opportunity to take risks and to not, that not to be like a negative thing. So that was really big, you know. So I thank you for that, you know, opening that and working together with people who are really, you know, collaborative and right. it's not just one-sided in the room I think it's really important for artists especially now you know yeah. it's changing the art form is changing and we need to change with it and I agree with you about um that and and applaud you for wanting to open up this this opportunity even more for people dancers that there is a sense of collaboration and agency because that actually builds a stronger community exactly, exactly. Yeah. and you're and then you're part of something exactly you know and people feel like they're part of it and they want to give more so yes. you know you get more out of people that way yeah yeah so um the last question an important question um part of this platform is building and supporting community what do you think needs to be shifted um, in terms of building a more equitable community? So, I mean, 
this has, you know, been the topic of many conversations recently uh, and unfortunately just more so recently rather than, you know, an ongoing conversation, but I'm glad they're happening. Yeah. And I think that a lot of it is about listening and that's kind of what I'm doing right now is I'm stepping back and I'm listening and you know, I would have said a year ago, well, you know, things need to change and those people in charge need to change it. And this week I kind of had, I was on a conver I was on a call with somebody and I had this like awakening, like you are the person that needs to make the change. <laughs> like you are in that position yeah. right now yes. and you have the ability to make that change. So that was like, I was like, oh my gosh. You know, like we have to do this. And like I said before, I'm in a position where it is a smaller company and I don't have a huge staff. I don't have a huge brand that I'm dealing with that I feel like we can like more pliably move into the future in a more equitable state. And, and where are those gaps? You know, where is the gap in the, the pipeline in training, um, you know, how are we reaching different audiences? What can we do better? So it's right now, I feel like I'm in a very, um, you know, gathering information stage, really trying to openly look at the organization and our city and what we can do feasibly with what we have. And then also not hiding behind the history of our art, you know, not saying this is the way it's always been done. So we're going to do it that way. And, you know, that's the only way it is to really say, hey, you know, what if we did it this way? That's okay, too. And we're not going to ruin it. You know, it's it's okay. Yeah. And also, you know, you speak about the history of our, but you know, a lot of the history of our has also been erased as far as um you know people of color and you know so that's something else to do to to and that's been happening too to recognize that there were there have been people of color in ballet not a lot but to bring that history back up you mm -hmm. know and that's one aspect but also yes totally agree with your epiphany those of us that do have the power you know and i'm on the other side like you even though i'm a freelance choreographer this platform is one of those ways that I'm building a more equitable. This is what I can do in my little isolated pocket in I, Philadelphia. Yeah. And you know, yeah. this online, the Zoom choreography I'm doing now is also, you know, that is part of the platform. It, it's about building so we and seeing a more equitable place in ballet. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, that is, yeah. Kathleen, um, uh, such a pleasure to talk with you after a while and also you know with you in this position and to see you know uh, that that young woman from 2005 and to see <laughs> that's a luxury of knowing a dancer for a long time you know these 15 years it's just it's just um inspiring you're inspiring you really are um so i would urge everybody to um go to festivalballetprovidence.org is that right kathleen Correct, yes. Great. To learn more about Kathleen and the company. And um, is there any other place that I could send them to, to, or is that the place to go? That is it, that's our okay. website. <laughs> Excellent, so um, Kathleen, if you wouldn't mind staying with me while I finish up the show. Wonderful. Um, Creative Vitality Jam sessions um, are now kind of in a podcast format. So you're still gonna see two new sessions every week. Um, and it's still going to be on Wednesday and Sunday. Next week, we have a little deviation. We're going to have three sessions. So there'll be another session, a surprise session on Thursday that we'll post that day. Um, but our next guest is going to be Malik Washington. He is a dancer, teacher, creator, and mentor. Also choreographer, pardon me. <laughs> um, in the description box below, when you go to the YouTube channel, you'll find a short bio of Kathleen and much more information about Creative Vitality Jam sessions. Um, I wanna thank the beautiful Gracie Spina, my Jedi co-producer, everything that has to do with behind the scenes. Thank you so much, Gracie, for every show. I wanna thank my beautiful, uh, 
energetic, full of passion community, the dance community. I am proud every day to be a part of you. Um, Kathleen, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Keep reimagining creativity, and I'll see you the next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.